The passage of nearly 3,000 nautical miles from the Galapagos to the Marquesa Islands is probably the longest you can make without the option of touching land. In my 36-foot boat Bambola it took just over three weeks and we averaged more than five and a half knots. It was a good experience running before the gentle 20 knot trade winds which only gusted higher in squalls. I sighted the most southeasterly island at dawn. A popular first stop for the boats heading west across the wide Pacific, the anchorage looks wonderfully dramatic. Hoisting the French courtesy flag before entering the anchorage was a moment of pride and achievement. It's very exciting to motor in towards the first landfall after 22 days at sea, and the Marquesas are the most dramatic and beautiful in the South Pacific. Fatuhiva was the first island group to be visited by Europeans, who landed here in the Bay of Virgins in 1595. It is the most isolated of all the inhabited islands as it doesn't have an airstrip. Although there are no border police or customs officials here, the French now turn a blind eye to visiting yachts, as long as you check in properly when you arrive at a port of entry. Certainly in terms of canoes without riggers and a powerful sense of belonging, many Polynesian traditions are still active. The ability to trade and drive a hard bargain with visiting yachts is still alive and well. Baseball caps and backpacks are widely sought after, and in exchange are offered the local fruit and vegetables which grow so easily. The French have provided this volleyball pitch. The young people playing here are on school holiday. Elementary schools exist on each island, but after that the children leave their islands at the start of each term and go to boarding schools in Tahiti for further education. Thanks to the help provided by the French government, concrete roads, satellite television as well as modern housing, enables the local people to live in good conditions without totally losing their traditions. The tribal structure is strong. Each village has its chief who rules the area and is highly respected. He runs the radio set which communicates with the French authorities. A couple of hours walk from the harbour is the waterfall. It's a charming place to swim and chill out away from the boats and the water is clear and pure as it runs down from the mountains. A chance to picnic, drink a little wine, eat some fresh boat-made bread in a place of pilgrimage for yachties who have not had anything but seawater to bathe in for the last weeks. An unusual blustery day blows us north to Tahuata, where we intend stopping in the anchorage described by Eric Hiscock as one of the three most beautiful in the South Pacific. Even 50 years ago there were always some yachts anchored here and it's easy to understand why. Unlike most of the other islands that have high mountains and cliffs down to the sea, Tahuata is blessed with charming beaches and rolling countryside. The centre of the island has a 1500 foot mountain range that radiates out in valleys down to the sea. We've heard that the merchant trading ship Anuni is due to visit the village just up the coast from here, and we hope to see it, so trailing our fishing lines, ever hopeful, we head north to Hapatoni village. This bay is rugged, but has a concrete jetty, and the main village of the island, together with its storage sheds, is just inland from here. It's nice to have the bay to ourselves until the Anuni drops anchor. This white merchant ship departs from Tahiti every month to make a 16-day trip around the islands delivering supplies and collecting trade goods, as well as carrying passengers.
The channel between Tahuata and Hibaru is only two and a half miles wide and frequently has gusty winds. We have to check in at Hibaru to get ourselves registered as legal visitors to the islands. Artuna, the island capital, is the administrative headquarters for the Marquesas group. The anchorage is as near perfect as you could wish. Very protected and good holding. The town hall is charming and traditional, and the police and the gendarmerie are friendly and welcoming as I check in. The French influence is everywhere and nowhere less apparent than in the cemetery. Beneath a Fajipani tree is the grave of the island's most famous immigrant. Paul Gauguin's paintings of the women of the South Pacific are justly famous. An exotic and colourful character, not much liked by the French authorities, but cared for with some affection by the islanders. His grave is decorated by the local people, who seem to have some sympathy with his retrobate ways. Nearby is the grave of the singer-composer Jacques Brel, who sailed into the island in his boat Ascoy with his girlfriend Madeley. They lived and worked on the island for many years until his death in 1978. The graves of Gauguin and Brel look out over the village to the Pacific Ocean. Both were rebels, and both embraced the lifestyle of these South Pacific Islands. Some wealthy French have homes here, but then immigration to the South Pacific started with Robert Louis Stevenson and Gauguin, and the 21st century has arrived even in this distant paradise. The town beach may have black sand, but local people still enjoy the warm water and gentle surf. With a group of other yachties, I've arranged with one of the local chiefs to give us a tour of the archaeological sites and tell us something of Polynesian history. This rock was the island's altar to the sea gods. Twice a year, a young virgin girl was offered to the sharks in the bay below. First, the priests took her virginity, then she was offered to the sea gods by throwing her off the rock. If the fall didn't kill her, the sharks certainly did. Dance, we were told, was a vital part of Polynesian ceremony, and the young men were all required to perform. When Captain Cook visited the islands in 1774, he was entertained by the dancing of the intimidating young warriors. It is a tragedy that following his visit, the decimation of the island peoples began with the exploring visits of merchants, whalers, and Christian Catholic missionaries. It was possibly the dancing maidens that kept him coming back, and it was the love of Polynesian girls that certainly caused the mutiny on the bounty. Our guide is not hopeful of improving the Yachty's dancing abilities, so he takes us to the superb site of Mie Lepona. This tuhua, or ceremonial site, is one of the best that's been excavated in the island groups. The big tiki is a statue carved in the memory of the wise and potent ancestor, Tiki Kia. These tiki carvings are found throughout the islands in the South Pacific, from Hawaii to Easter Island, from Tahiti towards New Zealand. It would appear that every community or tribe built a ceremonial place, a tuhoa, and placed statues and beautiful carvings around it. Tiki is also carved into stone, on wood, on paddles, bowls, dishes and war clubs. Tiki Kia is considered to be the founder of the human race. A Catholic bishop introduced horses, well, ponies, from Chile in 1856, and they're still the major form of transport. We stopped for a swim just outside a village, and there was another reminder of the changes brought to the islands by missionaries, encouraged by the French authorities as a way of subjugating a proud and independent nation. The Marquesas have the largest Catholic population in the South Pacific. It surprises them that the European yachts do not take Christianity as seriously as the Marquesans do. The island of Uapu is perhaps the most charming in the group. 
The soaring spires of rock are spectacular, and despite being the third most populated village in the islands, it's not often visited by cruising yachts. It was nice to have the anchorage to myself. The people here are famed for their wood carvings and building elegant ceremonial canoes of this type hauled up in the shade of the boathouse to protect it from the sun. What a beautiful place to live. It's quiet and lazy and although the local people were very courteous and friendly, they certainly didn't find our arrival interesting. The village itself is built from imported French prefabricated housing. They did, however, tell us about a delightful walk through the forest past the ruins of a village to the waterfall that supplies fresh water to the community. With my crew, Jonathan, we set out in the morning before the sun came up so we could wander around the remains of the original village before following the stream to the freshwater pool below the waterfall. So very, very beautiful. The church with glimpse from the anchorage is also lovely and its setting quite superb. Its interior cool and beautifully carved with local woods and shells, it could only be on a South Pacific island. I find it interesting that many of the shapes and symbols I have seen in the Tuhua ceremonial sites had found their way onto the carvings around the altar, or perhaps not so strange. In the end, it's a beautiful little church on a beautiful little island with all the grace and charm of a European religious building reproduced in local materials. Time to head north to the most sophisticated and modern of all the Marquesan Islands. The anchorage in Taioa on Nukuhiva is as crowded and busy as many in the Mediterranean, yet it's never full and is still undeniably beautiful. The French have spent a lot of time and money bringing this place into the 21st century. It has a modern key and, most importantly, a fuel dock. It supports a post office, bank, hospital, five grocery stores and an excellent hardware shop. The airport has frequent direct flights to and from Tahiti. The island is the cultural and administrative centre of the Marquesas, and from the quantity of ancient carvings and tiki, it would appear it's always been so. Europeans decimated this nation. The Spanish first visited the islands in 1595 and described the natives as friendly, but killed over 200 of them in various incidents. Captain Cook arrived in 1774 and only killed a few. American whalers called regularly from around 1800 with the introduction of alcohol, firearms and deadly European diseases. The French took possession of the islands in 1842 and started a systematic slaughter of the estimated 100,000 islanders. During this disgraceful period, 95% of the Marquesan people were annihilated. The population shrank to about 2,000. Nukuhiva boasts the largest waterfall, and the route there is physically harder than most. It's marked with signs which you must follow if you don't want to get very lost, particularly important on the way back. Several quite deep streams have to be forded, and you need to keep your fingers crossed it doesn't rain before you start the return trek home. When you get the first glimpse of Val Po waterfall, it makes the walk worthwhile. It plunges 350 meters from the plateau, tumbling behind rocky spires and crags. It's very different from the falls on the other islands, but sadly swimming's not recommended because of falling stones. Moby Dick was written by Herman Melville, but Typey was his first novel. It's based on his real-life adventure when he jumped ship in this very bay, Controller Bay, in 1842. It's about his encounters with the tribe that inhabited this valley in their village called Taipi. Today they're more peaceful harvesting crop cobra, dried coconut, 
and farming the verdant countryside. This is another valley not frequently visited by tourists or yachties, which is strange as it, as it seems to encapsulate modern life here in the Marquesas. Taipei is billed as an erotic adventure, but it's more interesting for its descriptions of the peoples who lived in this valley before the arrival of the French. His descriptions of the beautiful flora and fauna still apply today. Clearly the valley hasn't changed substantially. Much of the farming appears to be on subsistence level, and why not? Once you have a horse, a pig, a cow, and a house with satellite television from Tahiti, and you live in this tropical paradise, what more could you possibly want? This is certainly the remains of Taipei village, or at least the ceremonial Tuhua area. It would have been here that the village chief offered Melville the great honor of having his shoulders tattooed in order to signify his importance. In trying to excuse himself, he thought he ran the risk of being eaten. The exotically beautiful faraway of his novel is perhaps an ancestor of these girls living in modern Taipei. And maybe the piglet is a descendant of the ones on the whaling ship that brought Herman Melville to this valley. For me, the beautifully carved town hall lacks the majesty of the stone out in the jungle. The airport brings wealthy tourists and visitors to the island, and the hotel overlooking the ever-beautiful anchorage offers a swimming pool, cocktails, and performances of ancient dances adjusted to the taste of tourism, performed by bored locals. If the rhythm and dancing in the dining room appears less than inspiring, then it's because it happens twice weekly, every week, and all the tourists look alike. Possibly the dancing of Polynesian professionals in their sanitized costumes comes closer to how it really was. Who knows? The north coast of Nukahiva has a good anchorage, although because of the reefs it's not as extensive as it appears. It's as protected as you could wish for and a delightful last stop before leaving the Marquesa Islands. You have to climb over the mountain ridge in order to get to the village of Anaho, past a profusion of wildflowers and plants. This is a spectacular climb and walk following narrow paths over the saddle. Anaho village has possibly the best organized and most extensive archaeological site in the islands. The village has been rebuilt and reflects contemporary descriptions by Captain Cook. He also talks of big canoes with up to 40 men aboard and Polynesian folklore suggests that it was these boats which allowed them to explore and occupy the South Pacific. A boat of explorers with coconuts and breadfruit for subsistence would set out in a certain direction upwind, paddling day and night for a week or ten days. If they sighted nothing on their track, then they turned round and paddled back. All this without a compass. If they sighted a suitable island, some would remain, build shelters and explore, whilst the remainder paddled downwind back to their port of origin with the news. Once home, they would collect immigrants, women and farmers, and they would be brought out to the new discovery. From there, the canoes would explore and make further voyages. The fertility rites possibly were to do with the tiny groups of men and women needed to procreate swiftly and frequently and the sexual freedom due to the lack of women in any tiny new community. I would not have undertaken the four-day voyage to the Tuamotu Islands without GPS. Low-lying atolls are dangerous because you can only see the islets at best from eight miles off in daytime. Finding the pass into the lagoons is not easy when the charts don't match the GPS positions. And even when you find them, the tides run in and out very fast indeed, making entrance or exiting challenging. Oyster pearl farms sit on the coral reefs, and the channels are narrow with bommies, uh, coral heads, everywhere in the lagoons.
The villages are generally small and support only a few people as the land is sandy and unfertile compared to the Marquesas. The Happy Christmas and New Year signs were still up in the post office when I arrived in the middle of June, but I suppose it's silly to take them down knowing you'll have to put them up again. The islets are so narrow you can see the sea at the end of every street and the local pets have an exhausting time trying to relax properly. I get the feeling that the pigs are as much domestic pets as they are a source of food. The housing is distinctly smarter and more modern than those of the Marquesan houses and the anchorages are almost deserted. When another yacht arrives and launches his little sailing dinghy to go ashore, we feel it's time to move on. Rangaria is possibly the most developed of the chain of 78 atolls in the Tuamotus. I'm pleased to see the trading ship Anuni coming into the pass. If she can make it up the narrow channel between the shore and the reef, then so can we. You can see how strong the current is even at half tide as this American catch struggles towards the lagoon. Because of the clear water, the bombies don't represent a hazard you can't see. The only problem is judging your swinging range so you don't drift into them when the tide turns. Anuni anchors in these lagoons at least twice a month and she has a far larger swinging circle and a much deeper draft. The hotel is at the luxury end of the market. You need a lot of money to fly to Tahiti and then charter a small plane to bring you to this islet. When you check into your private thatched hut with air conditioning, refrigerator stocked with ice and goodies, and then fall out into the elegant dining room or the bar on the specially made pier, you know you're on a pretty exclusive holiday. The outrigger canoes are for the use of guests in case they fancy a meal out at the gourmet restaurant further along the beach. Strange to see such touristy signs after so long. There's one attraction that is unmissable, the pearl farm crouched on the edge of the lagoon. The cultured black pearls of the South Pacific are an institution. Lots of islanders are busy with this cottage industry, and a pearl selling for two or three dollars in Mahini will cost you ten times that in Tahiti, so it's a pretty profitable business. Early in life, the oysters are all joined together in long strings and put out into the lagoon to grow sufficiently big to receive the seeds that will eventually become pearls. Later when they've grown sufficiently, they come ashore again and are opened up on these tables with wood pegs inserted to stop them closing again. The boxes of opened oysters are passed to the grafters. These are the high talent, highly paid workers in the pearl industry. Little teams travel from island to island working for whichever pearl farm has a harvest of oysters ready for seeding. The grafter uses a scalpel to cut back the productive organ, the gonad, of the oyster and he inserts a very small graft from another oyster. The grafter then inserts a six millimeter perfectly spherical bead called a nucleus into the gonad so that it's in contact with the graft. Of every hundred oysters implanted, 30 don't survive the procedure and 30 reject the nucleus. When harvesting time comes, of the remaining 40 oysters, only five will have produced perfect pearls. This partly explains the high prices hundreds of dollars that are asked for black pearls in the tourist centers like Tahiti. The seeded oysters are tied into nets. Each has an individual pocket so they can be suspended in the lagoon until they've grown sufficiently big to be harvested and finally opened and their pearls removed. Lucky for some pretty lady but a bit sad for the oyster. In the next episode, we sail into Tahiti and explore the Society Islands and on across the Pacific towards the Cook Islands, Fiji and Tonga.